on this episode of Jeff Does Vegas. We thought we'd be probably four separate interview sessions of about an hour together, and then we'd have the whole thing together. Um, and uh, that was what we expected. And once we started, we, we both felt that there was such a momentum going that we wanted to keep going. We collected all that material, and then you can imagine how it, what it was like to edit this and narrate it and put all the bells and whistles on it in, the, in post-production. So it took a lot, a lot longer than we had anticipated. Las Vegas. It's more than just a city. It's a feeling. It's that feeling of excitement when you spot the lights of the strip out the airplane window. It's that feeling of awe as you stroll down the boulevard, taking in the sights and sounds. And it's that feeling of satisfaction knowing that you're in the greatest city in the world. Over 42 million people from around the world share that feeling every year. And I'm one of them. Taking you to the world-famous Vegas Strip and beyond, my name is Jeff, and this is Jeff Does Vegas. Undoubtedly, one of the most colorful characters in the history of Las Vegas is Oscar Goodman. Oscar has been a part of the Vegas scene since the mid-1960s when he moved to town to practice law and ended up with some of the city's most notorious organized crime figures on his client list. Following his time as a defense attorney, he successfully ran for mayor, going on to serve three terms as Vegas' big boss. He had a cameo role playing himself in a major motion picture starring Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci, and he even contemplated taking a run at the governor's seat for the state of Nevada. Now, as he's into his mid-80s, he's the subject of a new podcast series. Season three of Mobbed Up, The Fight for Las Vegas, focuses on the life and career of Oscar Goodman. And joining me for this episode of the podcast is John Katzalametis, Las Vegas Review Journal columnist who's also serving as the host of season three of Mobbed Up. John and I talked about the process of putting together this season of Mobbed Up, what it took to convince Oscar to be a part of the podcast, and the number of hours that John spent with Oscar collecting stories. Also, without giving too much away, John was kind enough to share some of the stories that will be featured in this season of Mobbed Up. Please enjoy my conversation with John Katzlametis. We started this process about a year and a half ago when I first asked Oscar to, if he would be willing to, to uh, indulge us in, in uh, the season three of Mobbed Up. And that's when it all started and we started the interview process then. And so it's been a long time coming. Um, you know, we, we, um, we've been waiting for a long time to get this together and, and uh, we finally have it up and we September 14th, the whole uh, eight episodes will, will uh, be ready on the uh, RJ website then. Well, I know when you and I saw each other last, which I think was probably in March, you and I saw each other at a Monday's Dark and we were chatting about it and you mentioned it. And I'm like, March, that's so awesome. That's great that, that the you know, yeah, yeah, we're going to get this. You, you were really stoked. You thought it was going to be out in like April or May. And then as the summer rolled around and I thought, oh my God, did I miss it? And I was checking the, the, mm-hmm. the podcast app to see if it was there and it wasn't there. And then I saw the news about September 14th and I thought, ah, oh, got to get John on to talk about it. Yeah, I'm glad to do it. Um, we the the time horizon was shifting for a lot of reasons. One, the foremost was when we started this process, um, and I presented it to Oscar. We just we thought we'd be probably four separate interview sessions of about an hour together, and then we'd have the whole thing together. Um, and uh, that was what we expected. When once we started talking, we did all these conversations, all these interviews were. Um, Oscar Steakhouse at the Plaza downtown. They were always about two o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesdays. That's just how, how we were doing it. And once we started, we, we both felt that there was such a momentum going that we wanted to keep going. And Larry Mir, who was our producer with us at the time, we just said, let's just keep going and, t- and, and see where this leads us. So that led to 15 interviews over a 17 hour period at Oscars um, that we had to, we, we collected all that material and then, you can imagine how it, what it was like to edit this and narrate it and put all the bells and whistles on it in, the, in post-production. So it took a lot, a lot longer than we had anticipated. And Oscar and I were both like, uh, when's this going to be ready? 
he was asking me and I was asking us, I was asking our team. And uh, I did a lot of narration, a lot of voiceover on it and uh, went back and, and we cleaned it up. We did a really good job of producing it. It was, it was this mobbed up season, if you're into um, audio editing, is really masterfully done. And uh, my role in it was to get Oscar to sit across from me and talk about himself. And that was, uh, that was a great process. I, I, I was glad to have achieved that. So let's take it back a, a few steps here. First off, how did you get involved in the actual mobbed up series? Because I mean, it's, it's been two separate hosts and the, the two previous series. And so you got looped in for, for series three. Was this you saying, Hey, I really want to do this. Was this them coming to you? How did this all sort of come to be you involved? Well, if they came to me, um, because, um, I have a relationship with Oscar, you know, I've known him for a long time and we thought this was the best way and maybe the only way to get him to sit down and do something like this was if I asked him, you know, and that's the kind of conversation we have. So essentially I was the best shot to get at him agreeing to do it. And I also had a previous history with, uh, with mobbed up in season two when, uh, Jeff Garman, the late Jeff Garman was hosting, um, about the history of the Aladdin hotel casino. My role in that one was to talk to um, Wayne Newton. I interviewed Wayne, and we uh, uh, talked to him about his involvement in, in the hotel when he owned it, his ownership of the hotel in the early 80s, and some of the ramifications about his um, relationship with the hotel and his feud with Johnny Carson and the, the mob era at the time in Las Vegas. So that was my, and I went to Montana to <laughs> interview Wayne. That was the same thing. Can you get Wayne? It was, you know, can you get Oscar? Can you get Wayne? I said, I will certainly give it a shot. And it, we made that worthwhile too. It was a couple of hours in, in the, at his uh, summer home or his other, other home in, uh, on Flat, Flathead Lake in Montana. So that was, that's how I've been involved in, uh, in Mobbed Up. I wasn't originally part of the, the core team of it, but I'm always available to do uh, that type of project. Stepping into the, the hosting role for Series 3 and sort of knowing the scope of these projects and, and how big of a project mobbed up was in the past, any intimidation, any trepidation about getting involved in this thinking, geez, I don't know, man, like this is a, this is a huge project. Were you concerned at all? You know, only because I knew it was, uh, initially I knew it was going to be extra work for all of us. You know, this was the, you know, my, my schedule didn't build in time with Oscar. Um, a lot of the people who were working on it on the other side, like my editor, my lead editor, Anastasia Hendricks, who's part of this and was uh, writing the script for it, for my narration, this is extra work. So we had to make sure that we accounted for the time in a way that didn't make it seem rushed or, uh, you know, uh, as, as <laughs> kind of like as a side project, I guess. We had to give it a high priority. And that was, that was a trepidation I had. And then as we moved forward, I think the thing that was, I was most aware of was um, giving it the right edit and giving each episode the right um, accounting. Because I'm telling you, Jeff, we had like the first episode on Jimmy Shagra on that case could have been an entire season. Tony Spilatro could be an entire season. The movie Casino. We talked long enough to make it a, a season. Lefty Rosenthal, his decision to go and, and become mayor. These these were all these are all episodes, but they could have been extended as their own season, really. So we had to make some very difficult decisions on how to um, how to use the content we had because it was a the thing was it was a lot more than we uh, anticipated going in. A lot more a lot more time, you know, than we we thought we'd have. You said that, I mean, they came to you to say, we, you know, we'd like to do this thing with Oscar. You're our best shot. Did you have any problem convincing Oscar to do this? Or was he like, yeah, I'm in. It was interesting because at the, at first he said, yeah, if you want to do it, let's do it. You know, it was kind of like he was originally trusting me just with the whole thing, you know, whatever we want to do. And then when we started moving into it, he was like, now, what is this going to be again? What's it going to be on? What's it going to be? And he kept asking me what, you know, he wasn't too um, in tune with what podcasts were exactly. And I kept saying, you know, this is like an audio documentary. Look at it that way. It's like a, a radio documentary. It's radio, 
essentially format. And uh, what's this again? What's what are we doing again? And he kept coming in, you know, and we kept talking. And and uh, then we were talking about um, and have talked about uh, putting what we went through in book form, making a book out of it, which is still something I'm very interested in. And he is too. He's really interested in that because there's so much good material. We got the best of Oscar in this. There's no question about that. We got the best of him through this process. Another thing I'll tell you about um, learning how to uh, speak with Oscar over a, a long horizon is we'd go into the plaza and we sat at the pretty much the same booth every time. We'd sit down and I had my fizzy water, I had Pellegrino there and we'd get, it, get everything set up and Oscar needed to have a martini. And uh, the martini set there, or we'd call for it, you know, and this was off hours at Oscar. So there was somebody on the F&B team who was, who was handling this. I said, we don't need the, we don't need the prop, Oscar. This is all audio, unless we do, are just taking, you know, individual photos. We're in casual clothes. We're not, you know, we're just hanging. And he goes, no, no, I need the, <laughs> I need the martini. I need it. I go, okay, okay. So we would he'd be talking, and he's having the martini. This is a live martini too. And uh, after about, you know, as the martini dropped. As he, you know, he, there was a point where he was really on top of it with the martini. You can hear him on some of the, I'm not sure if this is all in the final cut, but he'd say, oh, the, the martini's really kicking in now because I'm really remembering the dates, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, yes, it is. But after the martini's done and we've done, you know, about an hour, I said, you know, well, we're good. Let's, let's resume next time. And so, because we're, <laughs> we're, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> so then he'd, he'd go off and, and, and handicap his sports bets, you know, and stuff. You know, th that was his next project. But that was something that the, the martini was an integral part of lubricating this, this, these interviews. It was really, really funny that way. So, I mean, you and I are talking about Oscar, like, I mean, you know him really well, and, and I know his history pretty well. Anybody who's a, a, a Vegas history fanatic or I, I think really has a great idea of who Oscar Goodman is, but there may be people who are not familiar. Can you kind of fill everybody in on, on the history of Oscar Goodman? And I mean, it is a fascinating story. Yeah. He arrived in, uh, in, uh, 1962 with his uh, new bride, Carolyn from Philadelphia, where he was, uh, had attended law school and he was going to uh, begin a career in Las Vegas as, uh, as an attorney, as a, as a defense attorney. And uh, through the through the course of history, he became almost incidentally known as somebody who could um, was pretty effective with reputed members of the mob of, of organized crime. And that led him to um, such figures as uh, Lefty Rosenthal, uh, Herbie Blitzstein, uh, Tony Spilatro, especially, and um, getting them. Uh, you know, f fighting for their r constitutional rights and getting them, you know, um, not guilty uh, verdicts in the face of heavy evidence to the contrary. He represented Jimmy Shagra in the murder of uh, Judge jo uh, Judge Wood in San Antonio, Texas, which was a very big case at the time in 1978. Jimmy Shagra was a classic high roller in Las Vegas and him and he ran the biggest marijuana operation probably in history out of Las Vegas. Uh, flying back and forth from South America into Las Vegas. On that backdrop, he became a very successful and very wealthy man. He became a very celebrated figure. He was featured in the movie Casino as himself, representing uh, the um, Robert De Niro as Lefty Rosenthal character and Joe Pesci as uh, Tony Spilatro. He became known that way. And as he kind of, um, as his interest in being a defense attorney dissipated when he felt like he was just doing it to see how much money he could make. He entertained the idea of running for mayor of Las Vegas as his next frontier and ran it through his family, ran it by uh, Carolyn, his wife, and decided to run and won big in his first, uh, his, his first, for his first term, beating a man by the name of Barney Adamson and proceeded to serve three terms as a, uh, the happiest mayor in the universe, showgirls, martinis, the whole thing. Um, it, it did a lot to uh, initiate change in downtown Las Vegas, the Symphony Park projects, the uh, bringing Zappos uh, from Henderson into downtown Las Vegas was Oscar's um, doing. He, he generated that deal. They broke ground on the Cleveland Clinic. They broke ground on the Smith Center in his tenure. 
uh, World Market Center uh, came to fruition in that time. And uh, I think the only thing that he really felt like he wasn't able to achieve was get in his term was getting a major league sports team, a league in Las Vegas. Um, but stepped down, he was termed out in 2011. Carolyn ran, his wife. She's uh, closing in on the end of her third term. So that means as part of his legacy, we will have had 25 years of Mayor's Goodman in Las Vegas. And uh, now he's got his namesake restaurant at the Plaza, which is a licensing deal. He's got two statues of himself, uh, one at the Plaza and one at the Fifth Street School. One, well, the one at Plaza is with him and is him and Tony Spilatro, which has raised a lot of eyebrows and a lot of concern for people who don't like the mob. <laughs> Private business, so, so you know. So. But the the one uh, downtown is a, a publicly available. It shows Oscar holding a martini out front, right on the uh, right in front of the fifth legendary, the historic Fifth Street School. And there you have it. And he's still doing his uh, monthly um, dinner series talks at the Oscars restaurant and recounting uh, his career, everything from uh, his time with his clients, his battles with the law enforcement. He was a co-founder of the Mob Museum in downtown Las Vegas and is a great ambassador for that project. And uh, is still, a, a, you know, even in his 80s, his mid 80s, he's still uh, mentally very sharp and gives a great performance in his uh, his dinner series. So that's how I, and I've known him from the beginning of his first term. I've, somehow I've known Oscar all the way through on some level, better today than ever, especially after, <laughs> after spending 17 <laughs> hours with him. I'm like, wow, I really, I mean, now we're so comfortable around each other. It's like, it's interesting what happens, but I get him. I get him, what he is uh, is about through this whole process. He's a very proud man, very intelligent man, dedicated to his family and his wife, for sure. You mentioned some of the legal stuff that he did and, and that he worked with, and, and some of the stories that I've read about him are fascinating in that he, he didn't necessarily care. This was the impression that I got anyways, was that he didn't necessarily care if somebody was – guilty or innocent. He just wanted to make sure that they got a fair trial and things were being done above board and things were being done right. Is that an accurate thought? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is the, that is at the, that is the cornerstone of his career as a defense attorney, whether <laughs> with reputed mobsters or otherwise. Um, he's always said that um, his position wasn't to figure out if these guys actually committed the crimes or not. Somebody like Spilatro, for example. But it was to make sure that the law enforcement and the judicial system was following the Constitution. And Oscar was great at that. And he was also a great, uh, you know, trial lawyer. Loved trials. Loved, loved doing trials. Um, but yes, that is it. And so he would say, you know, uh, if you think that Tony Spilatro has killed two dozen people, 20, whatever the number is, uh, then and you never hung him, uh, hooked him on any of those charges. Then you're not doing your job. I'm doing my job and, and making sure that he gets fair treatment, legal treatment. So it's very, it's a very fine line that he's walked over his career. You know, you look at something like the Mob Museum. This hits to his his whole approach to his legal practice and his legal, you know, his cases that he took on. The Mob Museum is Mob Museum is a celebration of law enforcement. It's a recognition of law enforcement's victory over organized crime at the end of it. That's how it's presented. And that has, is how it has to be presented because you don't want to bring in a civic institution like this that is celebrating the mob or, or glorifying mobsters. So Oscar in that context is on the side of law enforcement as a spokesman for the, law, for the mob museum, in fact. But when we talk he is really agitated looking back on how he and his clients were treated and some of the practices by law enforcement, the surveillance, the trying to, you know, uh, put wires on people who are walking into his office, um, surveillance at his home, uh, you know, the family home. Him and, uh, uh, he and uh, Carolyn both talked about this. So it's an interesting tightrope that he's walked in his career as a, a prominent mob attorney mayor of Las Vegas, co-founder of the Celebration of Law Enforcement, and the guy who still has a statue of himself with Tony Spilatro at a restaurant named for him. 
all that is in the same cauldron when you deal with Oscar. And I'm, I'm very aware, I'm very aware of that when I, uh, when I've been interviewing him. I laugh at the story where, where you say about how he told them, you know, clearly you guys are saying that he did all this, but you're, you, you haven't caught him. So you're not doing your job. I seem to recall him doing a presentation. I, I think it was at the mob museum that he was doing one of their talks or one of their presentations. And there was an FBI agent that was there. And he said that to the agent in that, that presentation. And I howled because I thought he's not wrong. Really? Totally. Yeah, Jeff, it's, it, he says that a lot. He says it in his, um, you know, there, he's, there's video of him saying that to FBI officials, to their face. He's, he's brought it up in his, his talks at the mom. He's even brought it up a lot during his talks at the plaza and, uh, and said it in casually, you know, if, you know, if you were to go up to him and say, look, Tony Spallot was, well, Spallot was a bad dude. He did a lot of bad things. Oh, yeah. Where's the evidence? How come if he did all these things, how come he, how come he never spent a day in jail for it? And, uh, you know, look at the scoreboard. That's kind of it, you know? <laughs> That's kind of his attitude, you know? I get it. Without giving too much away about the podcast, are, are there any other stories that really kind of stuck out with you that just were like, man, I mean, you, you've known Oscar for a long time. You've had a lot of chance to spend a lot of time with him. But as you say, as the, the martinis flowed, things got a little more open with him was there anything that kind of stuck out that sort of surprised you there's a segment in in uh, in uh, the upcoming series where he talks about how he was not able to take a a recess wasn't allowed to take a recess uh from a case when his father died and uh you know he's jewish and they have to this has to be handled within you know, uh, a quick, 24 or 48 hours it had the, the body has to be uh, interned and he was very, even now, upset that he wasn't able to do that because the judge did not like him, according to Oscar, and wouldn't grant him that opportunity. He says, you're a professional, you could finish the case. That's in this. And, uh, you know, that was one time um, when he, you know, it was really a real moment. You know, I'm just thinking about it now. I was like, geez, you know, at what price? uh achievement you know um that really bothered him and uh he had talked about he's talked about um uh, his uh his uh, sister how she passed away as a result of um her, you know what he thinks is uh, her involvement in, in classical ballet and that culture has bothered him you know she had eating disorders and things of that nature that cost her her life and, and oscar was um, has said that he's had a problem with that artistic media he's a he's a man of the arts too oscar is he's having a play a musical written about him now you know and he's a very big supporter he's an investor and uh, in in productions and uh, but the, but ballet has been a tough thing for him to get around because uh, because of that and he hadn't really we hadn't had that conversation for the record before we talked about it a little bit off the thing but those were areas where oscar's real uh, his real feelings for his personal life came up, came about and his, uh, you know, and uh, it shouldn't come as a surprise, but the way he speaks of Carolyn and the whole climate of us talking about him, you know, I know that he's been saying, I hope, I hope Carolyn's okay with mobbed up, let alone, you know, he's going to have an opinion, but I hope my wife, I hope Carolyn's going to be okay with this. <laughs> I, just, like, I don't think she's going to be chasing me around with a rolling pin or anything. <laughs> We we interviewed we interviewed her for the for the um, for the series. She's in it, so those are areas I think people will be interested in. The, the whole decision to run for mayor is in there. Um, how he came about uh, that process, and his family had to be convinced almost collectively to to deal with this because they dealt with Oscar as the prominent mob attorney for so long, and you're going to go into the public forum with a, you know a knife fight for mayor of Las Vegas. So that was in there. Um, and I, I think that people will feel, um, we, we have some counter opinions in this too. You know, some of the people who he butted heads with the late Stan Hunterton is in this, uh, Jane Ann Morrison, uh, from the review journal columnist who tracked him in his career, who, who, you know, they butted heads quite a bit and still don't agree on everything. She's in it. Her voice is in it. The late Frank Collada, who Oscar detested. He's in it. He was, he's a leftover from the first season. He was a narrator of the uh, 
first season of Mobbed Up, Frank was, and then he p- passed away some, before I interviewed Oscar, but his voice is in this. So at the end of this thing, the very last episode is a collection of comments from those people that we, that we um, brought to Oscar before one of his dinner series as we were in, finished with all of it. We we're finished with the, all the time at, at the steakhouse during the day was done and we're, we brought it to him before one of his dinner series so he could, we could record him in real time answering some of these charges. And literally in the side room, the hideaway room of the, of the um, Oscar Steakhouse. So we go in there. So now we're dressed, you know, we're, we're ready to go. We're both wearing pinstripes and he's ready to go on in about 20 minutes. I said, let's just get, let's get this over with. And we had Kerry Roper with us, our producer, Larry Mir. And we sat down and he, <laughs> he heard Frank Collada's name, man. And I thought he was going to crush the recorder the digital we had he was he was fuming uh just had to the, i was like i could just stand here just, just answer oscar this is all on you know this we're, we're just recording you know that's in there you know his response to some of the things that people said about it. we gave him the last we, cl- closing argument i said this is you doing your closing argument which he liked but man i i'm telling you in that moment he he was back in the courtroom you know he was really fired up and uh I, I liked it. You know, we, we got all of it. We got all of Oscar in this thing. It's really cool. I love that you got the detractors on and that it's not, I mean, I don't want to say it's a, it's a, a love letter to Oscar per se, cause it really is. I mean, it's a love letter to his career and it's a, it, it's, you know, it's an amazing opportunity for him to tell his story and to get his story. But I love that you got the detractors on there. And I also love that you got his reaction to the detractors. I think that's yeah. fantastic. It's important to have that check, you know, to have, you know, let's see what other people have to say. It's not going to just be a whole <laughs> eight, eight part commercial for Oscar's career. You know, that's not what we were trying to do. And there are some pointed, you know, comments about Oscar from law enforcement, from Jane Ann. You know, from a lot of people, from the late Frank Collado. Um, I, I think that it was important because it puts it all in context. And But you, the takeaway of it is you get why Oscar has had his, his success. Nobody pitches a perfect game in their career or in their lives. But he, um, you know, he survived a lot of um, skepticism, a lot of counter uh, opinion, a lot of surveillance, and <laughs> a whole lot of battles in and out of the courtroom and on the campaign trail. I think one thing too, Jeff, as I look at this, I've always said I wish Oscar had run for governor. You know, I would <laughs> at the end of his third term, he was toying with that idea, and I wish it, I would like to have been on the campaign trail with Oscar Goodman as he went into Winnemucca and Ely and Elko. <laughs> <laughs> and these small towns in, in Nevada and see how he handled himself. I, I, that was, I think he would have won. He's such a talented communicator, but it would have been fun to see him take his himself into the rural parts of the state and be the mob attorney running for governor I th- and, and the mayor of Las Vegas. That's one thing I wish had happened. Was there anything from this whole process that ended up on the cutting room floor that you wish had not made it or you wish had made it into the, the series? There's quite a bit, you know, it's specifically, I don't, you know, we could run a director's cut of this thing as is and have it be, you know, <laughs> after going through the whole thing. Um, I will say that I, I like my fa- favorite parts are probably, we could have gone through the more of the personal life a little bit more, you know, his relationship with his kids and, uh, and how they perceived his career and how the, how that, uh, his image as a, a mob attorney really affected all of them. I think we could have flushed that out a little bit more. That would have been interesting, but it's mobbed up, you know, so we have to stay inside that umbrella. I think, um, but I was, you know, in doing it, I was saying, you know, we should just put this up unedited, raw, 17 hours. And if you're doing a cross country trip, just go for it. <laughs> if, you're <driving> to, <laughs> if you're driving across the country, have at it, man. <laughs> But we're, and I think what we're going to do too, I, my, I propose to Oscar that we take some of the outtakes and run them in his next, uh, in the October um, uh, dinner series talk. We have a lot of really good outtakes and have the audio come in that's not on Mobbed Up and have him talk about that and respond to that. There's a lot of really good material that he would love to hear that we haven't heard since we talked about it. And for him to come off and talk, you know, basically debate himself or expound on himself or me or whatever uh there's some very very cool uh moments in in that uh, process so those are the kind of generally where i'd like to see us go with uh, some of the un unproduced stuff 
I, I would love 17 hours straight of, of you and Oscar talking because I just did a road trip from Calgary down to Denver and that was 16 hours of driving over the course yeah. of two days. Mm -hmm. And you know for something like that, it, it would have been, that would have been fascinating. <laughs> well, the whole thing's going to end up like, like knowing the guy who has Grateful Dead bootlegs, you know? <laughs> hey, do you have, you have any of that Oscar Goodman stuff, you know? Um, but I do those drives to Idaho, too, and I'm always looking for, you know, the last, the last one I did was Penn Jillette's latest book, you know? And it carried me all the way through. But there's, there's some... Um, I, I think that we'd like to see, or at least Oscar and I both would like to see it in book form, uh, as I've said, um, and, uh, you know, some other some other medium. You know, it's very good. But we've not, this is the most complete account of Oscar's career currently that we have. It's it's him uh, and, and every capacity talking about his life. Um, and, and through his, like I said, through his parents and, and his upbringing in, in Philly. And I think, um, I think that there's a way to, that we could draw more out of it. Yeah. There's, it seems like there's lots of opportunities for bonus material and bonus episodes and live appearances. I know that's been mm -hmm. a thing that was done in previous series of, of mobbed up where yeah. they would go out to the mob museum and sit and have, have live conversations and live episode presentations and things like that. Any plans for, for that kind of stuff with this? We've definitely discussed that. We need to, you know, we're partners with the mob museum anyway. So we need to figure out just how to, how to logistically do that. There are two things that are working at the same time. I like, and Oscar likes the idea of doing it during a dinner series because he just picks a topic then. It's already built in. The crowd's already built in. We just come in and I can either co-host with him or I can fire him questions or he can just go on his own or whatever format. It'd be a lot easier and it's already there. Mob museum requires some coordination and do, you know, do we want to cater it? Do we want to, you know, how are we going to film? Where does the content? content go and all that stuff and for me um i would like to see that happen but it's not my uh role to plan something like i have the ideas like this you know i, I can help, help execute the the theme of it and and be up there with him and and draw it out of him you know, him and jeff schumacher you know who, who's the director of content over the mob museum would do a great job of this so more to be revealed i like the idea we haven't said anything though mm-hmm Excellent. Well, I mean, if uh, if people want to uh, to find this, uh, September fourteenth is the big date, and mm -hmm. uh, and they can get this anywhere that they find podcasts. Correct? That's exactly right. And you can find it on our website too, and it'll be uh, it'll be ubiquitous, as we say. And, uh, you can, I'll be posting it on my own at Johnny Cats on X and Johnny Cats One on uh, on Instagram as well, and you can cut into it that way. I'll, I'll post it on my Facebook page too. It'll be easy to find. And uh, I've been <laughs> I've been listening to it. I'm on my second round of it, and it's good, man. Not, not just because I'm in it. It's just the editing is so good in this thing, and he's he's terrific in it. Everybody who's involved in it is is very interesting. I am very much looking forward to listening, and very much looking forward to to sharing this with my listeners. I I think uh, my listeners are going to get a real kick out of this. I know I still. I still expound the the joys and virtues of the previous series of Mobbed Up. Season one and season two were were excellent, and I'm sure season three is going to be just just as good, if not better. It's it's going to be outstanding. Yeah, I don't think you'll be disappointed, and I appreciate you you know get, helping us get the word out. You know, I, it's it's an important project. Excellent, John. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jeff. Anytime. And that wraps up another episode of Jeff Does Vegas. If you've got feedback on this episode of the show, or any other episode for that matter, or you've got suggestions and ideas for topics you'd like me to cover on the podcast, please feel free to reach out to me via Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Jeff Does Vegas. Or drop me an email directly at Jeff at Jeff Does Vegas .com. In the meantime, thank you so much for checking out the show. Be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll know the moment new episodes are available. And don't forget to visit JeffDoesVegas.com for past episodes and show notes. My name is Jeff, and this has been Jeff Does Vegas, a Walker New Media production.